Oi, oi, it's your boy, Slacky J. Coming at you midweek because there's fuck all going on. Well, not fuck all going on, as we'll get into, but there were no fights last weekend. Um, unless you include Karate Combat, uh, which got me into beef with the owner of Karate Combat because I had a laugh about how, like I said on the boycast and on the previous podcast, um, everyone in Karate Combat gets hit with counter left hooks and shook up because they all have their chin up in the air and they're all punching off their chest, so they're completely exposed to it. Uh, and then their their champion, who, you know, in the hype packages, they had Bass Rutten going, I don't know if anyone can beat this guy. He got hit with a short left hook, counter left hook by, uh, uh, fuck, I can't remember his name. Good lad, though, uh, trains with the Pitbull brothers and really does look like them when he's striking. Um, and got his shit shook up and knocked out. So the guy who owns Karate Combat was like, yeah, well, happens in boxing all the time. Uh, look at Javante Davis versus uh, Roly Rom- uh, Romero. And he's sort of like, well, Romero's a shit fighter anyway. But also, it doesn't happen in every round. Someone doesn't get rocked by a left hook in every round of every fight, which is exactly what happens in Karate Combat if you ever watch any of it. Uh, but it is quite fun, and it's getting better, and I, I did chat about it last week on the boycast. Um, so that was my first exciting thing from the week um the other thing the the thing that's really just blowing my mind right now is um sakaki baro who i think i've slagged off on this podcast before i slag him off quite often um he he was the guy behind pride and then pride died because of him uh, and then they did dream without him and that was great and then they brought him back for Rising, and all the weebs were like, oh my god, Sakaki Bara's back. And there's this thing where like people pretend that they couldn't do it without him, even though Dream was like ran for about five years and it was brilliant. And Sakaki Bara, like his his entire thing recently with Rising has to be put you know, they don't even have Kyoji fight there anymore because there's no one for him to fight. So that's one of the biggest stars that Japan has. It, the rest of his game is to like put the future of Japanese MMA on the back of a kickboxer who hates MMA, Intention Nazakawa. So there was about three, four years of teasing Tension coming to MMA. They'd have him fight like absolute bums in MMA and he'd get by him just about. Uh, and Tension would publicly say afterwards, yeah, no, I don't actually want to compete in MMA. Uh, so then they started doing like more and more kickboxing matches for Tension, just fighting him. Because he fights good fighters in Rise and in... Um, is it knockout? No kick, no life? Whatever it is. But for, for Ryzen, they always have to put him against some MMA fighter who's never kickboxed before. So that was his plan, and uh, it didn't really work that well. But Ryzen's fun enough, and there are people who enjoy it, and I am one of the people who enjoys it. But he finally managed to book Tension versus Takeru, which is incredible in itself, because they, they really didn't seem to want to, even though they kept saying they wanted to. But, you know, my, my argument was always like, why not just take the $10 million you paid Floyd Mayweather to um, only offer your brand negative exposure and embarrass your biggest star? Uh, why not just not use that for Floyd Mayweather and just pay that to Tension and Takeru? You know, if you think you're going to lose the money either way, might as well make something worthwhile. But at any rate, he managed to get it together. And now the match, as it's being called, is being put on on June 19th. And do expect a lot of stuff from me about that. I'm going to do something, probably a big article. Um, thought about a video, but I think I seem to recall that um, Ryzen is quite um, strict with their like copyright stuff on YouTube. Uh, and also just I, I like writing, so I might just do some more writing. I've been doing more post-fight articles lately, and it's quite fun to be back in the game. Um, just reminding everyone how it's supposed to be done. But, or how good it can be done. <laughs> but there's no denying that this, this is going to be a huge fucking fight. Um, but it, they've already cocked it up at several points because it's a kickboxing match. It's the biggest kickboxing match. It's basically the best bantamweight on the planet. No uh, dispute, undisputed. Um, and they booked it for three rounds, which I can guarantee is a stipulation from Tension's side, not from Takeru's. <laughs> If you've ever watched Tension in a five-round fight, if he gets to round four, if he gets to the end of round three, he's gassed as hell. He's throwing rolling fun- thunders and staying on the floor for like 10 seconds. He's, he double-legged Rod Tang and just sort of laid on him. So that was a bit annoying that you're going to be the biggest event in Japanese combat sports probably in the last decade is going to be a, a three-round fight, three three-minute rounds. That's barely time to get in the ring. You know, there's the feeling out process. That's three minutes gone. And then you've got six minutes of fighting. 
But all of that aside, comes out this week that Fuji TV, which is a large part of um, any sort of Japanese combat sports success, having it on TV, they've pulled out of the of the fight. They're not going to do the deal. And apparently the deal was being, it was being treated as like a sure thing because uh, Fuji TV shows Rising. Um, Fuji TV used to show Pride back in the day. And when they pulled out of Pride, Pride died or Pride, you know, just faltered until they sold it. If you don't understand how like how big TV is in Japan still, um, the most watched fight in fight history is Bob Sapp versus Akibono. And I believe that had 26 million people watching it in Japan simultaneously. Uh, well, I mean, obviously simultaneously, but like those are numbers that no American fight promotion or fight ever is going to touch, which is why most American promotions go for the let's get more money from fewer people pay-per-view approach. But if you if you want to follow any of this, like the best way to do it is probably through uh, I think Carrier Fan, and there's a couple of other Twitter accounts um, who translate Japanese news articles and press events into English or, or live tweet like press conferences. And Sakaki Bara hosted an emergency press conference to basically be like, I have no idea why this deal didn't go through. Uh, we're working on something, but it won't be on TV. But the reason it most likely didn't go through is because Sakaki Bara has recently been embroiled with another Yakuza scandal. He's been hanging out with the Yakuza. He got um, blackmailed by some journalist, uh, allegedly. This is all uh, coming through Japanese kickboxing accounts on Twitter. I can't read the Japanese articles, but allegedly this is what happened. And it's just so funny because this is how the man tanked Pride. I was I was looking up articles from when Fuji TV pulled out of Pride, and they're say both Fuji TV and uh, Sakaki Bara are saying the same shit. Sakaki Bara is like denying he has anything to do with the Yakuza and saying that Fuji TV has definitely done background checks on him, so it can't be that. And Fuji TV is just like, uh, we don't really want to be in the fight business anymore for reasons we're not stating. So the the interesting part of this is, of course, that it's going to be. It's presumably going to be extended to Ryzen, who are on Fuji TV, and that's a large part of their success and, and ability to keep going. Um, so yeah, good on Sakaki Bara. I just don't understand how these people who saw Dream be relatively successful even without a TV deal, uh, and were like, no, Sakaki, Go- Sakaki Bara is a necessary part of this. Like, the man is obviously toxic. He's just tanked a second company, well, a second fight, possibly second company, in exactly the same way as the first one. Truly fucking baffling. Go check out the, the Carrier Fan um, live tweeting of, of the press conference because it, it does seem just like the um, the hot dog man going, we're all looking for who who's responsible for this. <laughs> and the best part is that um, Sakaki Bara claims that he handed in his, res- he, he offered his resignation um, to the other members of whatever, whatever it is, Dream Stage Entertainment, the people who own Ryzen, um, in case he was the problem and they wouldn't accept it. And you're just going... Either you're lying or they're fucking idiots. But anyway, uh, even if it is only me and 200 other people watching the match, we're going to cover the match in a couple of weeks. So the other big story this week that excited me was that Mansour Barnoui has signed to Bellator. Uh, If you hadn't noticed, Bellator like to steal my ideas and uh, pass them off as their own. But this is great, because I thought Mansour Barnoui was retired. I was like... (laughs) He hasn't fought in three years. He won a million dollar payday. Maybe he's just invested it well and is actually just, you know, working a normal job or whatever day to day and has X thousand, X hundred thousand dollars in the bank. Um, But no, he's a fighter, so he's back in the ring, but in Bellator now. Uh, And that'll be really, really fun. Uh, Massive lightweight. Uh, If you don't know Mansoor Banui, one of my most popular, um, or sorry, most requested now that I've taken it down, uh, Filthy Casuals Guides was uh, it was called the Filthy Casuals Guide to Freak Guards and my exa- my two uh, studies in that one my two case studies in that one were Ricardo Lamas who uses the reverse knee shield or the get the fuck up guard as I called it really well and Mansour Barnoui who uses uh, the giggler sweep or the John Wayne sweep or the one armed man I've heard it called the twist sweep it's a, it's a sweep from half guard um where you basically tilt the opponent from one side of your, of your body to the other and you keep their, their hand. So the way that it works in most elite grappling is that they post their hand because it's very hard to keep control uh, and you shoot an underhook and, and start working off that. So it's, it's like an off balance. But Barnui is so big and he's got this grip strength so he just grabs dude's wrists and, and sweeps them with it. I mean, it, sometimes they post and he does start scrambling through into other 
um, half guard techniques and coming up. And the the combination is actually what makes him very special. Uh, he had a great match with Islam Makachev, which some people felt like he probably deserved the, deci- the decision. Yeah, the decision. But he had a point docked for I think he was accused of fish hooking. It's it's kind of hard to tell what he did in the in the actual fight. But it, basically, you know, even from the start of his career, Islam Makachev is taking people down and smothering them. And uh, his fight with Mansoor Barnoui is just scrambly as hell. They're both all over the place. It was kind of like the Armin Sarukin one. Now, of course, that was a long time ago. I'm not saying that um, Islam Makachev hasn't got much better. I obviously did a Filthy Casual's Guide, which I think is still up uh, to Makachev and how he's improved over the years. And, and obviously Makachev has been fighting uh, UFC level opposition, whereas Mansoor Banui went to Road FC, which is a Korean organization, fought a load of Korean dudes, won the million dollar tournament. But in that time, he fought uh, one of Habib's cousins, who's trained by Habib, is part of that team. I, he might have been undefeated before that fight, but a very, very strong smothering top player. And that's probably the best recent example of Mansoor Banui using his bottom game against the modern, um, well, the Dagestani matter, I suppose. And it's just fantastic because anytime he's taken down near the fence, he turns himself away from the fence, which is what no one is doing against Habib and his, uh, Makachev and people. They're all trying to wall walk up and just getting stuck there. Um, but Banu is turning himself off, uh, threatening giggler sweeps. He did successfully gig- giggler sweep this lad a couple of times. Um, he was threatening ninja chokes on the inside. If the guy brought his head down too low, Banu would just try and choke him from the bottom of half guard. Uh, and it was really interesting watching it work. And then he, he finally got back to the feet long enough to knee him in the head and knocked him spark out incredible stuff but um i mean he also had a fight against kevin lee back in the day i think he lost that one too but again really fun scrambly fight and that was very early in both of their careers and he had a fight with matthews gamrot which uh Matuj gamrot which was pretty evenly fought he lost the decision on the, in that one too so yeah just a really difficult man to finish i don't think has anyone maybe maybe kevin lee did but um difficult man to finish difficult man to beat decisively uh and and very 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 tricky and even if you don't consider his his Funky bottom grappling. His build is very difficult to deal with because he's so tall at lightweight. So he'll be an awesome addition to the um, Bellator roster. I mean, he only has to get through Patricky Pitbull and Peter Queeley. Uh, that's the state of the Bellator lightweight division right now. Whereas their featherweight division is uh, pretty fire. Other news, the UFC is going to Paris at last uh, and they've booked uh, Robert Whittaker versus Marvin Vittori for that. That's going to be September 3rd. Good fight. Um, yeah, that'd be that'd be fun. I mean... The last big event in Paris was Czech Congo versus Ryan Bader too. So you know, they're, they're gagging for something decent. But why you wouldn't use a Cyril Garn event, you know, main event for Paris is baffling. Because obviously you're not going to do a pay-per-view there with Francis and Garnu, But you've got this world-class heavyweight. It just seems like an obvious uh, imitation of the Tom Aspinall situ- situation. Sh- shove Tom Aspinall at the head of a UK card. It'll do well. Shove Garn versus Aspinall at the top of a Paris guard. I'm sure it'll do amazingly. But anyway, it's a good fight. Lucky them in Paris. And then Paulo Costa got in trouble for t- assaulting a nurse, trying to get her to fill out his... I, I think I heard that it was trying to get her to fill out his vaccination card before getting vaccinated so that he could just take it and leave. <laughs> I, I'm so... I, I have trouble with uh, Paulo Costa because he's got this Twitter account where he does things that are quite funny sometimes and you think that he's quite self-aware and then you see him talk in person or you hear about things he's done you're like no oh actually he is an idiot that's uh, yeah he's he's really stupid like how actually outraged he was by the israel adesanya stuff after their fight top tier poster but genuinely shit for brains so what's going on this weekend well bellator continues its two-month hiatus <laughs> people, people are going oh my god this musassi card is stacked you know like they took two months off it bloody well better be but we'll get to that when that happens um the only thing really going on this weekend there's a there's a one card with i think a couple of kickboxing matches nothing happening mma wise um but we'll talk about that on the boycast if it's any good people asking for one stuff i tend to cover it on the boycast because i watch it when it happens midweek And then I uh, report on it afterwards. But the real main event this weekend, (laughs) God help us all, is Alexander Volkov versus Jarzinho Rosenstruik uh, in the UFC Apex. So no fans to boo it, which is nice. Um, Yeah. This 
This is one of those ones where I have made the mistake of getting excited for Jossie's, uh, Jossinho Rosenstruck fights before and uh, then been horribly disappointed. I gave a full preview of Rosenstruck versus Cyril Garn and then he did nothing. Um, but then I've also ignored Rosenstruck fights and then he scored an awesome knockout. So damned if you do, damned if you don't. But Volkov coming off uh, getting waxed by Tom Aspinall uh, easily... Well, obviously, easily Tom Aspinall's most impressive performance, but uh, the moment that I stopped thinking of Tom Aspinall as like a, eh, a a talented heavyweight to, oh, an actually talented heavyweight, or rather someone who's talented and also a heavyweight, <laughs> which is much, much rarer than a talented heavyweight. But Rosenstruck's actually coming off his own loss to um, Curtis Blades, uh, knocked out Sakai impressively before that, did nothing against Cyril Garn, knocked out Junior Dos Santos before that. But I, I think what intrigues me about this one is that Volkov, when he uses his length, is very impressive as a striker. And when um, people kick at Rosenstruck, he can be surprisingly quick on the entry. That's one of the things that has impressed me about him. And he only does it in bursts, which is really annoying. But there's there's the odd moments in his fights with like uh, Overeem and, pe- and people like that. He'll throw maybe a low kick or something like that, a, a sort of non-committal kick to get a kick back. And then they'll throw a kick and he'll um, catch it on the forearm, parry it across his body and, and step in with a big left hook and a right straight or something like that. But he closes the distance really quick for a heavyweight um, off kicks. It's just that he doesn't, you know, if, if his opponent won't do much, he won't do much to make it happen. And he could, you know, you're watching him going, yeah, you, you absolutely could. You just don't like getting hit. And I'm not saying don't like getting hit as in like, oh, he's scared of getting hit or whatever. But there are fighters who... Um, are happy to uh, take a blow to get things going or or risk taking a blow to get things going. It's that unwillingness to risk things that you really see in fighters like Rosenstruck where they're totally fine to to batter you on the counter, but if you don't come to them, they won't make you come to them. I mean, Anderson Silva, you know, (laughs) saw a Twitter thread today, uh, yesterday. Uh, It was very uh, big on Twitter, this thread. People would be like, Anderson Silva was the greatest striker in MMA history, and anyone who doesn't think so doesn't know anything about striking. But Anderson Silva, for the most part, flat out refused to lead. His leads were very measured and um, designed to look like a lot more than they were, or to keep him safe. So occasionally he threw out the front kick or something like that, or uh, a long side kick to the lead leg. But for the most part, he was on the counter, and he really rarely went to people to make the openings for counters. Particularly, I'm talking about, like, leading to get on the counter, not just leading so that the opponent goes, oh, I, I suppose I better lead now. Um, it's the difference between like poking people with the occasional front kick and going, come on, um, and actually going after people, hitting them and moving your head and, and getting them as they come back, you know, forcing an exchange. I think recently that the Volkov, I mean, it was always sort of a weakness in his game, the grappling, but he, recently it's been quite obvious. You know, Aspinall manhandled him, um, Blades just stuck to him the entire fight. I can't remember if there was much grappling in the Garn fight. I think Garn was pretty clean and, and technical on the outside in that one. But, um, you know, it's been a while. I think it had been a while since he fought any really good wrestlers. He fought um, over him, but managed to get him out of there quite quickly. But you remember, like, he, he lost a decision to check Congo back in Bellator with a good amount of leaning. He just, yeah, he, he never... He did beat Tim Johnson, who I suppose is a good wrestler, but, um, you know, you don't... Certainly at heavyweight, you haven't seen him have to wrestle a lot. He's been in with guys who are... It, it, there's sort of like an abundance of guys at heavyweight who are just massive and want to knock people out. So he's fought like Walt Harris, Derek Lewis, uh, Greg Hardy even, Marcin Tabura, who isn't even very good at knocking people out, but that's his whole game. You know, guys who are strikers basically because they're not grapplers, not so much because they're good strikers. <laughs> and, and those fights, he tends to do pretty well in. Um it's the guys who've actually pursued takedowns against him and, and uh, controlled him that have done quite well recently. Uh, I mean, obviously, Cyril Garn beat him on the feet, which was kind of a bad look for Volkov. But, I mean, Cyril Garn is very, very good on the feet, regardless of uh, of how well you regard various people's amateur and professional kickboxing records. I mean, you know, we're getting into that. Jarzino Rosenstruck's kickboxing record is an absolute joke. It's like 74-0, and 0, but no proof that half of them happened. <laughs> Does have a win over um, Benjamin, fuck, what's his name? A good heavyweight, though. So I think for this one, you know, if you're Volkov, you've got to keep things long, front kick. I haven't seen 
Um, Rosenstruck enter off front kicks very well. It tends to be like he'll throw a round kick to get the guy coming back with a round kick, or if they throw a round kick, he'll come in off it. I think Volkov's front kick could be a real problem for him here. Um, less so because both of them are orthodox. Volkov tends to use his front kick best, his right front kick against um, southpaw fighters. He'd be, he'd be a lot better off if he could just switch hit, but he doesn't tend to do that. It would be interesting to see Rosenstruck try and back Volkov up in this one because um, against Augusto Sakai, he had, mo- he had Sakai circling the fence, circling with his back to the fence for most of that fight. Uh, it'd be very interesting to see if he can do the same to uh, Volkov. Obviously, there's the danger of the uppercut, which is a good weapon from Volkov, and also the, um, the, the intercepting knee. But both of those are weapons that have put him in trouble in turn. You know, fa- I mean, fo- most famously, Derek Lewis knocked him out with a, uh, an overhand off the knee, but I've seen him get hit off the uppercut a few times too. Um, and they're weapons where if he throws them, you can still drive him backwards to the fence, even if he hits you. And then getting in on those quick three twos, which are a, a huge part of what um, Rosenstruck is able to do. He moves very quick for a big man. Neat feet for a big man. But that's basically all there is to consider about that fight. There's a chance it's good, but there's also a large chance that it's not. The co-main is actually quite interesting. You've got Danny Gay versus uh, Movzar. Sorry, not Movzar. Movzar Evluev, who I've talked about before. He's, he's a fun guy. Um, he's, I think his reach is quite normal. But if you look at a picture of him, like whenever they show him in the, uh, in the um, pre-fight stuff, you know, well, actually they do that shit uh, like uh, video of people shadow boxing now. But they used to show like a, a full length picture of people on each side of the tail of the tape, and his arms always look like Artem Lobov's. You know, they, they come to, his hands are next to his uh, belly button. But he's an interesting guy. He's been around for a little while in the UFC. Only 2019, actually, but uh, beat Sungwo Choi, Enrique Barzola, uh, Mike, Grundy, Mike Grundy, split decision against Nick Lentz, and then he beat Hakim Duodo. Um, all decent fighters, not top-tier fighters, but I suppose Dan Ige is considered sort of within the top-tier bracket. Though Ige on a two-fight losing streak of his own. Chan Sung Jung and Josh Emmett, which I don't actually remember. Was I away for that? Oh, that was in December. So I have no recollection of the Josh Emmett one, but the Chan Sung Jung fight was classic Ige. Um, just bad, bad game plan. Uh, but then he knocked out Gavin Tucker just before that, and everyone remembers that one. Lost to Cal- uh, Calvin Cater and lost to Edson Barbosa. Well, he beat Edson Barbosa, but he should have lost. And he got a split decision over Mirzad Bekti. So actually, he's regarded as like a top 15 guy, but basically like one convincing win in his last one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, six, six. One convincing win in his last six. I mean, it's a, it's a good test for Evluev. It's, um, I mean, it's a good test to see if Danny Gay's still decent um or, or, or has made any changes to the stuff that was uh, letting him down in the first place and then the rest of this card is basically filler you've got alonzo manyfield versus a last minute replacement askar mozarov uh, but the guy he's replacing wasn't that good either you got felice herrig returning for when was the last time she fought fuck oh wow she fought jander Rober in 2020 and got armbarred in round one yeah i mean it's felice herrig um but she's fighting Karolina Kowalkovich. I mean, just basically, it's a situation where one person has to pick up a win at last um, if we match them together. Joe Selecki's fun, so that'll be fun. He's, he's against Alex De Silva, who hasn't fought in a fair bit, actually. He fought in um, the end of 2020, lost to Brad Riddell. But Joe Selecki, he, he beat my boy Austin Hubbard, and then he beat Jim Miller, which is a good good name to have you on the record, even at this stage. Uh, but then he lost to Jared Gordon um, in October. So... Uh, the hype train a little bit derailed there. But he was on a great little run from um, 2018 to 2021. Very legit grappler. Hilarious fight with Matt Wyman. Anything else good on this? Uh, you got a, a, light, uh, sorry, a flyweight fight between Jeff Molina and Z- uh, Zalgas Zuma- Zumagalov, um, who are both fun enough. And then Odie Osborne I quite like. He looked um, he looked good, actually, I thought, against um, Manel Cape. And that stoppage off the flying knee was a little bit quick, uh, which kind of annoyed me. But he rebounded with a, uh, a win over Vergara. Just another fun fighter in the flyweight division. But taking on a 4-3 and three late replacement again. So it's just, these cards, are not only are they not good to begin with, but they're just absolutely smashed by replacements. Yeah, that's about it. And I mean, the reason that that's so bad is firstly because they can get away with it. Um, but secondly, and because they have a set number of events that they need to meet to um, get the $300 million from ESPN. But secondly, because there's a couple of good boxing matches on this weekend. 
you got uh, Nonita Denaire versus um, Noya Inoue again. Uh, or sorry, Inoue versus Denaire because uh, Inoue is the champion. It's a rematch of their 2020 fight, 2019 fight. One or the other. They had a banger. Um, it's, uh, to me, it's always fun to see Nonito Denaire doing well because he was in his prime about the time I started writing, uh, back when he was just lightning fast, unbelievably quick fighter, uh, in- incredible left hook, and just huge power for his weight as well. But he lost to Guillermo Rigondo back in um, 2013, and that was when people thought, oh, he's, he's slowing down a little bit. No, you know, Rigondo, elite in his own right, but you know, people thought he was slowing down a bit. He lost to... Um, Walters in uh, 2014, Frampton in 2018. You know, people were going, oh, then he did it past his best. But he had that fight against uh, Inoue in um, 2019, at almost 37 years old. And he got dropped a couple of times, but he really did put in a um, a great effort for a guy so advanced in his years. Now he's, now, he's since won the WBC bantamweight title and defended it. So he's bringing something to the table against Inoue in terms of silverware. But the downside is that he's 39 years old. He's almost 40 for a division that is so quick and moves so quickly. It's, it's, it's incredible what he's done already at that age. But, um, you know, he took a bit of a beating two years ago when he was almost 37. Two more years is probably not speeding him up any. Um, so unless he comes in with a real clever game plan. I mean, I'm not, I'm not convinced that Inoue is um, unstoppable by any means. You know, he's a huge hitter, obviously undefeated. Lots of people rate him in their pound for pound top ten, but really, I mean, the the intrigue here is if Nanito Denaire can pull something out of his ass um, based on his experience in the ring with Inoue, rather than having gone back to the drawing board and been like, "Oh, I fixed my nutrition," or you know, the things that fighters always do. He's really got to bring something clever that he's spotted to to get the best of Inoue here. Um, whereas Inoue just has to be Inoue because he's still well, how old is Inoue now? Yeah, he's still twenty nine. You know, top of his game. Also a monstrous body hitter, which, again, Nanita Denaire always been sort of light on his feet, very, very quick. Sort of like a speed and power fighter. You know, those guys who um, surprise you with how hard they hit for what a clean technical boxing game they're, they're bringing. But that tends to get worn out quickly if you start banging people in the body. And he took a horrible body shot in the first fight, which also it had sort of a long count thing about it. There was some controversy. But, you know, it's just a fun fight that's going on this weekend. And... Um, Definitely worth watching. I mean, it's always worth watching in OA anyway. But if Denaire can pull something off here, you know, I'll, 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 I'll just um, erect a small shrine to him in my garden. And the other one this weekend that I'm a little bit more interested in and invested in is Devin Haney versus George Cambosas. Um, we talked about Cambosas when he beat uh, Teofimo Lopez. Where, when was that? That was a few months back. But he looked incredible in that. Absolute boy, boy making performance, um, hooking off the jab constantly. Just uh, looked incredible against a, a much bigger hitter and a guy who was blisteringly fast in his own right against um, Lomachenko. And then Devin Haney is, uh, well, it's, it's, it's <laughs> fucking WBA and WBC have both got like a regular and an interim title. So both George Cambosas and Devin Haney is from the WBA and WBC at lightweight. Um, Cambosas also has the IBF and WBO. It's for all the belts and more than the number of actual belts. <laughs> There's six belts in play, and there are only four belts. Um, but Haney's interesting because uh, he's he's one of those fighters who is accused of being like a Mayweather clone, um, sort of like uh, Adrian Broner. I mean, he hasn't embarrassed himself like Broner yet. But I mean, Broner was very talented. But you know, it's uh, people remember the worst bits. People remember the the slip ups more than they remember the good performances. But Devin Haney, very clean boxer, doesn't get hit a lot. Hides behind a lead shoulder very well. Ties up all the time. <laughs> uh, great jab, great, great. This is the thing. People accuse him of being boring. People accuse him of uh, not fighting to get finishes. Uh, he hasn't got an awful lot of finishes in recent years. You know, it's hard to tell in boxing because guys will have like a 70% knockout ratio. But then you see that the moment they start fighting good opponents, that just dries up. Because you'll spend 15, 20 fights just fighting absolute bums, building your record. But um, his his... Not his most recent one. The one before that against Linares, uh, I thought he looked really uh, sharp. He, he looked a little bit like Floyd when he was trying to hurt people, which was always fun. Um, the Linares fight was great. He has this. He has one of the best jabs you're going today. Is you know gen- generally people agree on that. 
you know, even they don't, even if they don't like him, he's got a very good jab, which obviously plays really well into a, a high lead shoulder, stone wall, shoulder wall, roll stuff, shoulder wall. Um, but he has a really nice body jab, which again was another Floyd trade secret. Uh, Floyd Mayweather, Sugar Ray Robinson, two of the best body jabbers of all time. If, if they're, you know, <laughs> it could, could be coincidence, but if those two are, are good at it, it's probably worth getting good at. It, it's just such a, a hole in the in the guard of any good boxer. Your your guard doesn't, you know, the, the any guard you take in a boxing match, uh, with the exception of, um, who was it used to have like their hands folded over their stomach? Oh, Fulmer used to fight with like a wrong-sided cross guard. <laughs> so his right hand was across his belly. Um, but generally, every boxing guard is set up to protect your head and, and the most valuable dangerous shots. So elbows tight to stop shots coming in from the side of the body. They don't tend to cover the solar plexus, which is a, a tricky thing to cover because you have to bring something inside the line of your body. So even good boxers can be drawn into dropping their hands or trying to make um, adjustments to, to deal with a body jab and get caught over the top. I mean, Floyd himself got caught with, um, it was like three body jabs and then an overhand from uh, Shane Mosley. Because even if Floyd mo knows better, Floyd was very much a perfectionist and he was annoyed by get these these punches landing on him even though even if they weren't hurting because a lot of a lot of people's reaction is also to just take it but if you body jab well you can actually really tire someone out it's the the hole in the death star the, the one they built in that you can just drop a bomb in for no reason um and it exists in everyone and devin haney against linares was using a beautiful body jab he was doing this great thing where he was extending his hand to jab the head and sometimes he'd jab the head or sometimes he'd just stiff arm on the face. And sometimes he'd jab um, across to Linares' lead glove. And then he'd step deep into like a side-on stance, into a horse stance, and uh, drop his weight and, and level to punch the body. And his hand would only come back a couple of inches and then he'd drop from, from the jab to the head. It'd come back like a couple of inches and then he'd just step into the body. And it, his whole body weight seemed to be going onto the punch to the, to the body, but... The arm was barely involved. It was really impressive. Um, if you, yeah, go watch the highlights of the Linares fight because uh, he does it about the midpoint of the fight. He, he hits several in a row. But I was just watching that going, that's really cool. Real classic example of that drop step that Dempsey was always talking about. Like letting yourself fall onto your lead leg to get power in the punch, to put your weight on the punch. Actually, um, you know, I've already said Stonewall today, but Champ Thomas, uh, his... Uh, one of his books, he says, stand with your jab out against the wall so that your jab, your fist is on the wall and then pick your lead leg up. And he said, like, that's the feeling you should have when your fist connects with the person. Your weight should be going through the fist. You're, basically, their face should be holding you up. <laughs> but yeah, Haney's really good. You know, um, that, that Linares fight was a really good example of him looking good because Linares, you know, getting older now, but gave a good fight to um, Lomachenko back in the day. And difficult on the counter too. Great counter left hook. Um, and Haney's throwing like wide rights to the body, weaving under the return. Constant level changes, really uses them well. Right straight to the body, left uh, jab to the body, right uh, wide right to the body. All of those using them excellently to just um, punish Linares for covering up upstairs. And in the moment that his hands come down, Haney will level change to the body, you know, as if to hit the body and swing in an overhand or something like that. Ties up off half his punches. Uh, yeah, that will get you accused of being boring and... Frankly, you know, if you're not going to infight after that, it is boring. Um, you know, that's the difference between a lot of these guys who use punch and clutch and someone like um, Roberto Duran, because he would punch, clinch, hands over the biceps and start hitting from an infighting position. You know, the, the clinch, yeah, sometimes he'd use it to smother the offense and take a break. But most of the time it was like he'd clinch to stop the comeback and then he'd free his hands and start hitting again. But I'm really intrigued by this one because um, Cambosa's not a great hitter. Um, you know, on paper, neither of these guys are great hitters, but Devin, Devin Haney seems to have a bit more pop in his punches. But Cambosos, really, uh, I, I want to say quick, but like Lopez is very quick, but he seemed to have really good timing. He could read Lopez really well, get his hand there quicker. Um, and it, he's one of those fighters where you, sometimes you're watching him and he doesn't look amazingly quick, but he's still beating the guy to the punch. You're going, well, he must actually be really quick. <laughs> it's uh, it's one of those things where uh, we're always talking about this, but a, a fight, it, every attribute is only, uh, it's, it's a binary thing. You know, you could be the fastest guy in the world or the second fast. If you're the second fastest guy in the world and you're fighting the fastest guy in the world, 
sorry, you're the slow guy. <laughs> it's, it only matters in the match. If you've got two slow-ass fighters fighting each other and one of them's quicker, he's fast in that fight. Fast and slow is relative to the one other man in the ring. Or maybe the ref. <laughs> it's, so it's like the, the flyweights are always running into Chris Toyoni, but um, it's very hard to get squashed by heavyweights as they circle the cage. So yeah, sorry, that, that's the one I'm excited for this weekend, Cambosas versus Haney. If you're gonna if you're gonna watch anything to get excited for this weekend, I'd say find the, the highlights on YouTube of Haney versus Linares and Cambosas versus Lo, uh, Lopez because those are just two. Uh, I don't want to say star making performances, but they're they're definitely the be- like the best you can hope for from Haney. Like that's the the exciting Haney when he turns up, and that's the the best introduction to Cambosas because I didn't know who he was before that fight really. Uh, I don't follow boxing that closely nowadays. Just a few names that I know I, I enjoy. And then if someone beats them, I go, oh, better keep an eye on them too. <laughs> um, so yeah, find those. Um, and then we'll do a question and get out of here for today. Oh, forgive me, fellas. We're going to get into the weeds. Um, Hi, Jack. On Boycast episode 25, you mentioned the rhythm step and how Barry Robinson hates it. I did a bit of research and found Barry Robinson's latest instructional, and he explains that both the rhythm step and the L step mean pulling your lead foot back next to your rear foot. You are stationary, predictable, and vulnerable. On the other hand, in Trevor Whitman's Balance DVD, he wants, fi- he wants his fighters to use the L step and rhythm step and pimp step, reverse L step, don't know what that is, uh, as a way to regain balance and to avoid the natural in- inclination to lean back from opponents' punches uh, as well as change positions. Who do you think has the correct principle? And that's from James. Um, right, bit of uh, background. A rhythm step is stand with your left foot forward, bounce your left foot back to your right foot, and then back into stance. That's a rhythm step. And you'll see guys do it all the time, shadow boxing. You'll see guys do it in fights. It's uh, a bit of a divider on people. Barry Robinson is a, a boxing coach who had, a, I think he had a YouTube channel for a bit. But um, we were talking about, this This came up in the course of talking about instructionals and things because uh, I said I wouldn't recommend his instructionals just because they're very, he's got a very long-winded way of uh, getting to his point. But um, yeah, he's a knowledgeable guy. I enjoy it. He's just sort of like uh, boxing Danaher. <laughs> it, it takes a while to get there. Um, whereas I did recommend people check, pick up Trevor Whitman's um, DVDs because they're, they're also excellent and uh, a little bit less long-winded. But uh, there is a bit of a divide on this rhythm steps and L step. Sorry, the L step is this: you draw your lead foot back again, back exactly as you would in a rhythm step. But instead of stepping back into your stance, your right foot now steps out to your right. So it's a side step. Now both things have, well, no, they don't have different uses because some guys use the uh, L step to just sort of like circle around the ring out in the open. The L step does have a terrific use along the fence if you are. Uh, backing towards the fence or ropes. Sorry, boxing is where this came from, so you know, ropes too. But if you're backing towards the boundary, and believe me, we're going to be talking a lot about using the boundary in the upcoming Filthy Gadgets guide to um, Valentina Shevchenko that I'm working on this week. But if you're approaching the boundary and your back foot hits the boundary, you are pretty much out of space. But what you can do is collapse your stance to use a, to create a little bit more space between you and the opponent as you hit your sidestep. A great example of this would be Joanny and Jacek against um, Jessica Andrade. She hits the fence. She knows Andrade is going to leap in with a left hook, so she can't just start circling right. She collapses her stance and then steps out to the right. You know, it's it's not like step, step. It's like step, step. You know, you do it basically in the air. Um, You go from a, a bladed stance facing the opponent to a bladed stance sideways from the opponent. You know, you're running parallel to them. And she gets away, scot free. Um, that's one of my favourite examples, but there's there's quite a lot. You know, it's um, it's a real old school boxing technique, especially for side on fighters. You basically have to be able to do that because you can't. The more you circle the ring sideways, the more your stance becomes square, and your feet under you. You know, it's um, if you watch like the golden age of the USA boxing, USR, USSR, uh, USSR boxing rivalry. Um, the US boxers are all standing a lot taller and, and circling with their feet closer together. They're not standing so side on, or a lot of them are. You know, they, it became a, a focus of theirs, lateral movement with straight hitting. Uh, you know, a great example of this would be Muhammad Ali, who circles the ring not in a stance, but when he jabs, he drops into his stance first and then jabs. And it's very, very quick. You know, you, you watch it in slow-mo, you'll see it though. He, he drops into his stance and then he jabs. But I think this is a thing, like, it's all about 
how you rate economy of motion. Because Barry Robinson's point is correct, you know, in, in that if you draw your lead foot back on, underneath you, you are leaving your stance and you are, if you'll press the ropes or something like that, you are vulnerable. Uh, you're not in position to punch and be punched comfortably. But equally, there are lots of fighters like Willie Pep, you know, classic, uh, a guy people talk to, point to as like a, a brilliant technician, but fought nothing like textbook boxing. Um, but there are lots of guys who flatten out their stance to move around the ring with the intention of avoiding getting caught along the ropes. You know, to, to catch a guy, to hurt a guy when he's out of position, you have to get close enough to him. And if he's, if he's out of position so that he can move more freely around the ring, out of his stance, um, you have to close him down and get him to the ropes to do that or to the fence. Great example of that in MMA would be um, Dominic Cruz. I've given you a couple from boxing already. Muhammad Ali, Willie Pep, uh, Tony Canzaneri to a degree, a little bit further back. It's about your attitude to leaving stance because stance is a thing that protects you and keeps you being in stance. The purpose of being in stance is that, one, you're set up so that you can block punches and avoid punches and throw punches. Two, if you take a punch in stance, you're a lot less likely to fall on your ass. But by abandoning the stance, you can you can um, make moving around the ring laterally easier. And you can use steps back into stance as a faint, as a faint in their own right. So if you watch Dominic Cruz, you know, he's always stepping in and out of his stance. He steps forward with his left foot into stance and then he steps back out of stance. And he's constantly stabbing that lead leg in and the opponent's reacting to it. And it gets even more interesting when you start considering things like Muay Thai, which has a much shorter stance generally. Anyway, not everyone. This is like when people say there's no footwork in Muay Thai or whatever. You know, uh, generalizations. But typically in Muay Thai, you fight from a shorter stance because you want to be able to withdraw or pick up your lead leg to teep or to check or whatever you're going to do. But um, I keep referencing this this great uh, video that um, Sylvie Douglas Von Itu made with uh, Hippie Singmani and... Uh, it's true of a lot of guys, you know, she's she's doing this amazing Muay Thai legends library where she goes and st- uh, trains with various golden era fighters or, you know, not always golden era, sometimes silver era, silver era, just, just generally great fighters and learns lots of different things. And obviously with these things, a lot of these guys disagree. You know, so she's going one place, getting coached one way, and then she'll go and see another legend and they'll go, who taught you that? That's rubbish. You know? But, um, you know, that, that thing about Bruce, that Bruce Lee said, like, if you got all the master, uh, if you got all the top students in the world in a room, they'd, they'd disagree on everything. But if you got all the masters in a the room, they'd agree on everything. Not true. Because <laughs> everyone is training, uh, particularly when they're starting to teach people, they're teaching them in the way that they can get them into their style the best or the easiest, you know, it's, you streamline an approach to training people uh, and you streamline your own approach to dealing with things. There are guys who can throw a wicked, I don't know, um, left hook in Muay Thai, but they're much better out of range using their kicks and things. So they don't get to do it that much. There are guys in wrestling who can shoot an amazing high crotch on one side, but they, but everyone they face stands with the other foot forward. So they don't do it. <laughs> it's, uh, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that d- dictate what's available to you, but that doesn't mean that something doesn't work just because you're not using it in your day-to-day stuff. But as I was saying, Hippie Singmany he did this amazing session with um, Sylvie, and there's a few others. I think Karahat did the same thing, but he'll show uh, circling the, the ring, fighting going backwards. Uh, I can't remember what the style's called. Moi, there's like f- five different ones. Moi, Cow, Moi, Fumu. Moi, Cow is people who go forward with knees and clinch work, I think, but... Um, you know, someone more into the Thai terminology than me will tell you that. But the the like typical back moving trickster sort of archetype that they like over there. Um, a lot of it is bounce, floating around the ring with your feet almost level, bouncing your lead foot back level to your rear foot, and then teeping with it from there, like push kicking with the with the leg. That, so you do a rhythm step, and then instead of putting your foot back into your stance, your lead foot, you you push kick instead. And that works. It looked really slick when he was doing it. And I watched some of his fights and I saw him do it in them. Um, very slick. But yeah, a practical application of the um, of the rhythm step. And in uh, point karate and, and old school karate, there's the, there's a thing called hikikomi, which is where you withdraw your lead leg and then you either kick with that same leg or you kick with your what was your back leg. But by bringing your legs level, you've um, created a bit of uncertainty in the opponent. And also, you know, you can kick from closer in. As in, if the opponent's coming at you with a kick or something like that, if you stand there and check it and put your foot back down into your stance, you, you're too close to start kicking them. But if you pull your leg back away from them, you can kick with either leg comfortably as they're out of position. So withdrawing your leg into your stance is not a problem in a lot of sports. It's actually a benefit. 
And withdrawing your, your foot into your stance in rhythm isn't a problem if you're circling the ring and you're, you're safe. It's a problem if you do it instinctually and the guy can then capitalize on it. So if you're aware of how he's going to try and capitalize on it, which is going to be double jab you to the ropes or, fa- or cage or boundary, um, then you can deal with that in its own way. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a problem, but like any problem, if you know that that's the problem... There's multiple ways you can deal with it. You don't have to stay in your stance all the time for fear of it happening. So there we go. Real in the weeds, inside baseball, nerdy shit that 90% of people won't care about answer. But yeah, look up the rhythm step. Look up the L step. Um, when you see them done well in a fight, you'll notice them because they're... Well, the rhythm step is pretty much a constant, but the L step, you don't see it applied very well that often. But you do see guys use it constantly, like Jersey Joe Walcott used to just circle the ring with a little bouncing L step. Uh, much shorter application, not taking big angles or anything like that. But he just did it. He just circled off by doing a little hop, skip, L step. Anyway, rambled on in long enough. Um, I, I think that covers for the fact that we didn't get to talk about anything this week that happened at the weekend. <laughs> I am your boy, Jack Slack. Um, if you want to sign up to the Patreon, get in on all the extra boycasts, articles, shit I do, definitely do that. If you want to send an email to the podcast, jackslackpodcast at gmail.com. And if you want to see what I'm writing anytime, fightprimer.com. I am your boy, Jack Slack. Sakakibara's sad salaryman stare, bless.